Krishna Padiyar. Uh, he is a project manager, World Fish uh, uh, Bhuvaneshwar Odisha. Then Dr. Bikram uh, Keshari Balir Singh. Uh, he is uh, from GIZ. And from MSSR of uh, Dr. Velvili, uh, head of uh, Fish for All Research Center. Uh, I will now introduce the uh, chair. Uh, Dr. Madhudu uh, Vijay Gupta, actually uh, he served many national and international uh, institutions and uh, his research uh, is spanning over uh, 60 years. Uh, he has worked in uh, more than 20 countries. His pioneering work in these countries has helped many farmers to increase their income as well as uh, nutrition. His work uh, with women farmers actually paved way for their empowerment. Uh, he is the first person in India to break the yield barrier and doubling the production in aquaculture and laid foundation for the uh, blue revolution in India. Dr. Gupta worked as fisheries expert for over 30 years with various international uh, agencies like the UN Economic and Social Commission for so uh, Asia Pacific, then FIO UN, then World Fish Center. As research coordinator of International Network on Genetics and Aquaculture, he developed many genetically improved strains of fish resulting in uh, increase in fisheries production. Uh, he also received uh, many uh, honors, among them are uh, Sasang Peace Prize, uh, which is considered alternative to Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, he shared with the uh, President of the Republic of, uh, Republic of Kiribati. Then he also a recipient of World Food Prize uh, in Food and Agriculture. He also uh, received Trillion Meal Lifetime Achievement Award from International Union of uh, Food Science and Technology. Then Lifetime Achievement for Neutral Life Award from the Association of Nutritical and Health Food Indus Industries. And he also received the Eminent Agriculture Scientist Award from Government of Andhra Pradesh, then Out Outstanding Team Research Award from Indian Council of Agriculture Research. Then he is a member uh, in many expert com committees, and also he received two honorary doctorates. Uh, with this, uh, I leave the floor to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, when the UN declared the year 2022 as the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, my thoughts went back to early 2000s when I was working at the World Fish Center. At that time, attending the food debates, uh, uh, discussions at national, regional, and global level, we felt that the fish has not been receiving the attention it deserves in the food debates, in spite of the fact that 50 million people globally depend on fisheries, and also it co contributes substantially to the food and nutrition security. So we had a consultation globally with various experts, including Professor Swaminathan, and felt there is a need to bring awareness among the policy makers at national, regional, and global levels, and all the funding agencies, the necessity to give more importance to the fisheries sector in the uh, food debates and food security issues. And with that intention, an initiative was started called the Fish for All under the leadership of Professor Swaminathan, and it has had an eminent personality as the board members of the initiative. To say that Professor Swaminathan is not only a great scientist, a visionary, a planner, but also he uh, practices what he preaches. Subsequent to that, as we all know that uh, Dr. Swaminathan has started this Fish for All Research and Training Center in Tamil Nadu. So I'm very happy that at last I'm seeing that in a lifetime that the fishery sector is receiving the attention that it deserves. And uh, I think it goes without saying that uh, we all, it's not only at the global level, 
now even the national governments are giving more importance to the fishery sector for example within in india we can see that uh, uh, 25000 crores has been allocated under the pmmsy and also a separate um, section or ministry has been created for fishery sector uh, in india and also many other countries so with this little introduction i won't don't want to take more time and today we have five eminent uh, experts dealing with fishery different aspects of fishery sector who with a vast experience and they will be talking to us how we could improve the lives of um, people in the uh, hilly and coastal areas with, with uh, keeping view the sustainable development of the ecosystem uh, so should i introduce the first uh, speaker or you are going to introduce Sir, he can uh, he can introduce. Oh, okay, sir. Our first speaker is Dr. Kuldeep K. Lal. Uh, he will be talking on the fish genetic resources of plant regions, their management and utilization. Dr. Kuldeep K. Lal is the director of ICR National Bureau of Fish Genetic Resources, Lucknow. Before joining. As a director, he worked with Network of Aquaculture Centers in Asia Pacific or NACA Thailand as coordinator of genetics and biodiversity program. He is a member of COFI Advisory Working Group on Aquatic Genetic Resources of FAO. He is associated with various consultative bodies and the Department of Fisheries, National Biodiversity Authority, and Deep Sea Mission, etc. His research interest includes conservation genetics and aquatic genetic resources management. During 30 years of research career, he has extensively worked on exploration of fish genetic resources, genetic stock identification of wild, relative, wild relatives of aquaculture species, and long-term sperm cryopreservation technology, and its commercial level in quality crop seed production. He is working to establish a model for conservation of indigenous germplasm and harmonizing with the livelihood for native coastal and island communities. He has published more than 140 research papers and described 13 fish, shellfish species or new, or new distribution records from India. Now I hand over to Dr. Kuldeep K. Lal. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, most respected uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, nice to see you after a very long time. And I'm honored to be invited at uh, this uh, conference. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, organizers, for uh, inviting me to speak here. I have been, uh, I will be speaking on the fish and resources of plant region, their management and utilization. Briefly, I will be going on the what is, uh, what, uh, what the kinds of genetic resources in aquatic systems in upland areas are there. Then coming to what is the utilization <coughs> status, which is at very infancy stage. But there are lots of opportunity coming up in the PMMSY for the sport and there are some technologies coming which are being adopted by the farmers. But it is still at an infancy stage. But we have to take forward. And uh, I'll be discussing my views on the, uh, how we can include science into this, developing these models, and also deriving a model, what we have from the coastal area, how that can be used for the community of, uh, participation. Uh, uh, and um, first thing I'd like to uh, explain about the services, what fish genetic resources diversity they give. It's general, like in all the ecosystem, it happens. They provide ecological ecosystem services, economic and trade, and most important for direct consumption by the human being, fish is considered as a health food. It's important for the nutrition security of the local population, as well as for the export. It is a local pride and religion. Many of the places, particularly in the upland regions, you will find the massive areas where they are used for the watching, fish watching, that itself become a tourism, or the temple lakes, 
they have got masses which are where it is customary to feed the fish uh, along with the worshipping. And, uh, and, and the most important for the future, it is a germplasm for science and posterity. Hillfish genetic resources in India, if we talk, they are from the Himalayan rivers, primarily Indus, Ganges, and Brahmaputra river basins, and rivers originating from the Western Ghats, Krishna, Kaveri, Barpula, and Chalakudi, and Peria, their headwaters specifically. And temperature range can be sub zero to 20 degrees centigrade. And at present, the 258 fish species are known from 21 families and the 76 genera. And in Himalaya, they are 203. And in Dakhan Plateau, nearly 91 species are known. Some of the food fishes, I'll not name each and every uh, species. These are snow trout and exotic carps, uh, catfishes, uh, and as well as the eel. And some of the ornamental fishes belonging to the genus Pontius, Botia, and the uh, goldfish commonly known Caracias. Then indigenous species in this, the particularly they are known for the game fish. Tor Potitora comes under the 20 iconic fishes of the world. It is known for the, as a game fish. Internationally known, there are many competitions which happens in India for the, in, uh, for the sport. So this is also a, uh, another avenue for the livelihood in the upland region, not only aquaculture or food, but it is a, as a sport fish. So golden mahasir to Putitara uh, comes as a one of the first 20 iconic fishes due to its size it can grow. Nowadays though we do not get that sizes, but in the history, if you see the uh, manuals from the uh, sports associations, you will find the people handling the fishes above 100 kg also. Then uh, major stresses which are causing FGR in the issue because the most of the development projects in, comes in these ecologically sensitive areas, which are the mountains. Because you have to cut the roads, you are reached up to the boundary of the country, you have to have the development projects, electricity, but all this, unless it is equilibrated with the biodiversity, there is a stress on the fishes, particularly the migration is stopped, which are related to the food and the breeding habits. And at the same time, it, many of the places, it becomes a, from a lotic to lentic environment, and that also changes the ecosystem type where they survive. Some of, uh, one of the important things with the, these fishes is their temperature sensitivity. Their, uh, they can be divided into two categories, urethermal, which can sub sustain from the very uh, sub-zero temperature up to even the uh, tropical conditions. Uh, snow trout, Shizothrax, if we see, they can, they can be found in the Indus, in the Ladakh, where the top of the river becomes snow uh, in the winters, but they are found in the lower uh, ranges of the Kosi also. And even we have raised this uh, snow trout in the Lucknow also. So that is the urethermal nature of these fishes. Mahasir, I'll be coming very specifically based on our work that uh, how we can use this, it's a temperature tolerance. Then the sternothermal, like uh, these are exotic trout, which survive and breed in a very narrow range, like two degree to 10 degree and that kind of, and they won't survive beyond that. Fish production from the, at present from India, this is from the stat source, is the Handbook of Fisheries of Government of India. It hardly produces one point at, as a fisheries, not from aquaculture, even from capture total, it produces only 1.02% of the total inland production. It's minuscule, and it's not a very organized one. Upland FGR for livelihood, it provides three opportunities. One is ports and capture, ecotourism, and the another thing which can be developed now, that is aquaculture. Free strata for culture in the upland region, they can be above the 1500 MSL, they are the trouts, again exotic. 1000 to 1500, they are Chinese carp, which can be cultured, again exotic species. And below 1,000, recently it has been introduced as a some minor cast like Lebedero and all. But our aquaculture in the ape land is only dependent on exotic species. That is one of the point I'm making it. It is only based on the exotic species which were in introduced during the colonial period. A few cases of culture like Bangana, Dev Devi and all we have uh, taken up that is in the Manipur area, but they all are localized. And Pengba, Ostia Brahma, uh, Belangari. New package of practices and adaptation, a new, it is a new emerging trend in the hills. 
And uh, I will credit that to our sister institute, that is the Directorate of Cold Water Fisheries. Some of the examples I will be taking from them. And Sikkim, with their efforts, has become a new state which is contributing to the trout production, uh, which was not, which was earlier only JK and the Himachal Pradesh. What are the emerging packages of practices? They are not widespread. One of the things it is important for aquaculture in the upland areas is that terrains cannot be uniformly considered all the places. So there is need, will be need for the regional specific practices which can be adopted at a particular level uh, combined with the regional species which are, uh, to which the local population uh, are dependent on consumption. So one of the example is the multi-track entire integrated fish farming using poly tanks. These poly tanks were used by the farming community for the rainwater harvesting. So this has been integrated, and that is in the Kamau Hills. Culture of rainbow trout in the flow through raceway systems, Sikkim, and under PMMSY, there is a provision to provide the money for the raceway system. And recirculating aquaculture, it is just recent, they have introduced in Ladakh. Uh, system for rainbow trout in a flow through raceway. Now, what is the way forward for aquaculture? We, this is our status. We have minuscule production from aquaculture, not a uh, credible uh, production from the indigenous species, but what should we do now? It needs science-based interventions and community involvement because they are, uh, they, most of the time, they are people with a la small land holdings. We need to increase productivity. There are small spaces very finite resources with the, those people which are in these communities. Produce more from less. Diversification. Species with the native importance. And we need not to always target uh, aquaculture for exports. We must uh, introduce aquaculture for the local consumption to have the food at the local level which is nutritional, which makes them nutritionally secure. Rather than always start thinking aquaculture should bring the foreign currency. And uh, regional specific practices and co-management can be the cue for that area. And marketing and cold chains if we are to produce high value species. Uh, one of the example I will like to uh, highlight here is for export, somebody has started culturing in Hyderabad rainbow trout with a total recirculate system and maintaining the total cold environment. Okay, fine. It can be good for the export because you can harvest the money. But it is not a, a thing where you safeguard energy. That is also the thing that you are putting a lot of energy from the country to make it uh, the export. OK, somebody has money, he can put it. He can do anything. But if you see how much of energy is uh, being extracted from the country, uh, improved variety, selective breeding program. Here I like to give uh, an example where we can have a lot of uh, opportunities. What is uh, our rainbow trout population that has been introduced since the last one and a half century by the Britishers and later by government of India from different countries. So these are feral populations which are adapted to our local environment. Why not we use, develop a selective breeding program from all the genetic stocks. We are always importing, trying to import the higher growing varieties. But these feral populations which are adapted to our environment they are important now. If we study, we scientifically characterize them and develop a selective breeding program, we can have a, a rainbow trout which can develop faster, grow faster, and at the same time, adapt it to our environment. And when I say the regional specific practices, I like to say, highlight one example from Nepal. They brought out small scale feed and, and brought the rainbow trout with the uh, ecotourism, like local restaurants with a small scale, okay, we cannot get export because the export market is very sensitive to the flesh quality and uh, its uh, texture as well as the oil content. Okay, but indigenous market, it can feed. So they developed a uh, low cost trout which are, uh, which are kept by the outside, outskirts uh, restaurants where the people go and take the live fish and then eat and uh, have picnics. So that is the kind of one, one model that has been quoted by in one of the book by in the FAO. Uh, that, that was a Nepal model which, which was also sustainable because it was giving local population the uh, uh, avenues of trade, local population avenue of the, from the low cost production and local nutritional security.
And then most important thing is once we go with the scientific information, we must have the quality seed and input. Recently, one trout feed has been developed by the uh, DCFR, and it has been uh, given the technology to one of the India's leading company, which is giving under the brand of Nutrella as a trout feed by the Growell. Then propel us to disease risk intensification. Because once we intensify aquaculture, diseases are bound to come. So we must be prepared how we tackle the emerging diseases and minimal impact on biodiversity. And we can have the technology introduced in the selective breeding program using crab sperm. The fig figure what you show, see here, this was done by us in 1998 by transporting frozen sperm from Brot, Himachal Pradesh to Nilgiris to crossbreed on the request of the Tamil Nadu government. It was a crab, a frozen sperm held at uh, our center for eight months, and then it was frozen, which, which shows the picture of 1998. Now, uh, community aquaculture. I try to give, this is an example from our work, which is in the Agati Island. But uh, I, okay, let me finish it. Now, here what we propose the model, and that can be uh, uh, implemented in such areas where the small scale people are there, where you collect the wild germplasm, we develop breeding technology, it is upscaled, and the, we close the life cycle. F2 seed we give to the communities, local women 82, we have uh, actually trained in Agati, now they are rearing, in case you go to BGP Marine Kingdom, the shrimp, ornamental shrimp, the small scale which is being sold, that is raised by these women and uh, that has been produced. There's no wild collection. It has been produced from our hatchery. So these are the models by which we can also contribute towards the ABS sharing uh, to the local population and communities earn. And we, uh, we comply with many of the SDG goals through that. And the local women who have a free time, they get empowered without taking risk of going to see for collection of anything and all that. So this is preparedness for disease surveillance. We are leading one of the largest, it's a global uh, largest program on disease surveillance. In India, it is law, the, the disease control in the aquatic animal in 2014 amendment. So this surveillance program is widely acclaimed internationally because it improved our reporting credibly. And at present, two centers, uh, uh, three centers are there which are handling the uh, upland areas. And the second phase has already started which will be carried out pan India on disease surveillance. And uh, strategy for harmonizing uh, conservation stock enhancement, this is important for the native communities because they earn from the local co collections. So many co fish species has been bred captive breeding. But at the same time, we can have the propagation assisted rehabilitation based on their stock, genetic stock based knowledge and the ecosystem management so that we improve the local captive stocks as well as we rehabilitate the species where, when they are declining from their certain areas of uh, distribution. This is documenting the FGR. This is one of the species. We still know many of the biodiversity. This is one of the species from the cave in Meghalaya. It is the largest species found in the any caves in the world. Recently, we have, we are, our work is almost completing, and this cave species, we are finding it as an undescribed species, and shortly we'll be publishing it. This is, was the one area where people said that taxonomy is the only basic science, but taxonomy can lead to useful things. Here, if we see that this, gra uh, this paper, this was published by us in Organism, Diversity, and Evolution. Thor Masal Mahanadikas, which is found in Mahanadi River, and Thor Putitura share the same lineage. That means in the prehistoric era, somewhere Thor Putitura, Golden Mahasir, has migrated to the Mahanadi, which the species which lives in the 6,000 feet MSL and living in the tropical. That means that has got some kind of thermal adaptation. In the climate change, that kind of science can be useful if we find the molecular mechanism. We initiated the work under ICA's uh, NICRA program, and some of the uh, pathways we have found, and by collecting the fish from Tehri Dam, as well as which is upland, nearly 4,000 MSL, and from the Mahanadi. And there uh, has been found in the, some of the genes and the pathways, uh, physiological pathways, where there lies the difference and which controls their thermal adaptation. So concluding, hill ecosystems can play a significant role in intensification of aquaculture and has not been harnessed for the available potential. While the communities in the mountains have poverty and the low level of development, 
So what we need is science-based interventions for mainstreaming FGR. Mainstreaming means conservation and utilization, sustainably. Regional relevance, but at the same time co-management. And we should, they should be allowed to contribute to national and important international compliance, which are NDGs, SDGs, and access benefit sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kuldeep Kailal. You have brought out important uh, information on the field stream fishes of uh, India, the factors that are distressing on the development of the field stream fishes, and also the areas where we can undertake some um, developmental activity, like diversification of the species, including the native species, selective breeding programs, community participation of communities in aquaculture development in hilly regions, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, surveillance of aquatic diseases. It's a quite good and impor important information that you have given. We hope that uh, the developmental agencies in the hilly regions of the country will take into uh, account to what you have suggested and that will lead to a development. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. E. Vivekanandan. Uh, Dr. Vivekanandan will be speaking on climate trends, impacts, and adaptation strategies in coastal ecosystems. Dr. Vivekanandan belongs to uh, Agricultural Research Services of India and has a long years of experience in marine fisheries research and man development. He worked in various capacities in ICR Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute. At present, Dr. Vivekanandan is a senior consultant in CMFRI and Bay of Bengal program intergovernment organization. He has pioneered the research on fish stock assessment, climate change, marine mammals, and marine fisheries management. He has traveled extensively and is associated with several international organizations like FAO and Bay of Bengal uh, Large Marine Ecosystem Project. Dr. Vivekananda, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, I think you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I? Yes, sir. It's visible. It is visible. So it will be operated from your side? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I thank the MSSRO for providing me this opportunity uh, to make this presentation. So my presentation will be on climate change and the marine and coastal ecosystems, particularly on the on marine fisheries. Uh, so uh, next one, please. So we, we all know the importance of uh, the marine and coastal ecosystems. Uh, the value, it, 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 uh, the marine and coastal ecosystems provide a wide range of ecosystem services for the benefit of uh, humankind. Uh, the value of uh, the ecosystems have been uh, estimated as 125 trillion US dollars. That is the global uh, ecosystem service value that includes coastal and marine. Uh, which has been estimated as 50 trillion uh, US dollars per year at the global level. Uh, in India, very recently, uh, the coastal and marine ecosystem service value has been estimated as about 24 billion US dollars per year. So in a sense that the coastal and marine ecosystem value contribute uh, about 40% to the total global and ecosystem service value. So here, there is a, it's an ideal choice that uh, the blue growth strategy of different countries, including India, are embarking upon improving the service that is being provided by the marine and uh, coastal uh, ecosystem. So it is an opportunity to promote jobs and growth in this sector uh, of uh, uh, marine and uh, coastal ecosystems. Uh, next one, please. So uh, to come uh, uh, briefly, I would like to say that uh, in India, there are several very critical habitats which are important for the sustainability of these ecosystems. Uh, they have a large bodies of uh, estuaries, mudflats, salt marshes, 
mangrove forests, coral reefs, seagrass uh, meadows, and also a number of keystone species like the cetaceans and dugong, turtles, seabirds, whale sharks, seahorses, and the sea cucumber. It's not an entire list which I have given, but I have given uh, selectively a few keystone species as well as the critical uh, habitats. So all these uh, habitats and the other ecosystems, they provide the ecosystem services like the provisioning service, the regulating services, and the supporting services as well as the cultural uh, services. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, but uh, there are several uh, issues here if we want to achieve the blue growth strategy to its uh, fullest extent, we need to address many issues that will be happen hampering the growth of, of the blue growth strategy. I have tried to put all these issues into four major categories. One is unsustainable uh, fishing in the coastal and marine areas. The other one is the habitat degradation because of land use changes. Many of the critical habitats which I have shown in the previous slides are getting, are getting degraded uh, due to land use uh, changes, construction activities, and several other land use uh, changes. And then also the aspects related to pollution. Uh, we have the pollution from the plastics very recently, and also pollution from uh, the agricultural uh, base, which are entering into the coastal areas through the rivers, which are causing serious uh, problems to the ecosystems and also to the resources. And the last uh, uh, the category which I have given here is the uh, climate change and uh, variability, which, has, which is acting as an add-on to the already three existing uh, uh, issues that uh, we have flagged here. So this is going to be the major issues in the uh, years to come. And I think we should uh, try to uh, address this issue uh, with the fullest possible extent uh, in, the, in the near future uh, very quickly. Next one, please. So I will be uh, concentrating on mostly on the climate change and variability, with particularly with particular reference to coastal and marine uh, fisheries. Next one, please. Yeah, uh, before going into the actual problem uh, uh, affecting the marine fisheries, I think we should uh, know the climate change pathway uh, and how the pathway uh, from the atmosphere to the oceans, what is the pathway that is there? Uh, from the greenhouse gas accumulation in the atmosphere, we know that is a global uh, warming and uh, that is transferred to the sea. So there is seawater warming that is happening and the seawater warming uh, has a series of impacts uh, on the physical and chemical aspects of uh, the sea, as well as on the resources. So if you see the seawater warming, we have the uh, reduction in oxygen concentration in seawater and also expansion of oxygen minimum zone. What we have observed is that oxygen minimum zone is expanding particularly in the central part of the Arabian Sea. And then there are changes in the oceanic current that is being uh, noticed to now and also changes in the ocean current stratification. So this oceanic current and the stratification changes that has a lot of impact on the distribution of the marine fishes and other resources. For example, the larvae are getting, uh, are getting shifted to undesirable destination because of the changes in the ocean current and the stratification. And then we have the sea level rise uh, at the rate of about one millimeter per year that happened in the last 200 years, but it is now going to be about, uh, it's going to increase in the future and it's going to be three to four millimeter uh, per year in the, in the coming years. We have the increase in the intensity of cyclones. The number of intense cyclones are increasing. That is cyclones with the velocity of 100 kilometer per hour and more, that is uh, increasing in the Indian Sea. And then similarly, we have the intensity of rainfall also increasing. That is uh, the 20 centimeter per day rainfall. That sort of intensity is increasing, causing floods uh, in many locations that we are observing regularly now. And also, we also witness the droughts also parallelly in several other areas. So the sea level rise, increasing cyclones, and the intense rainfall 
combinedly it uh, it uh, it enhances the storm surges in the coastal areas causing loss of property and the lives to the local population on the other hand at the top side of the picture you you will see that ghg accumulation because of the because the carbon dioxide is getting absorbed by sea water there is ocean acidification the sea water become becomes acidic and in the last 200 years uh, the ph has reduced by 0.1 unit but uh, in business as usual scenario it is going to be 0.4 unit uh, by the turn of the century so in this picture the 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 boxes which i have given here the top three boxes ocean acidification reduction in oxygen ocean current changes these are all directly impacting the fish resources and also the other resources the the other boxes like sea level rise increase in intense cyclones rainfall and storm surges they are this these are having direct impact on the livelihood of the coastal communities livelihood as well as the lives of the coastal uh, communities next one please so coming to the marine fisheries in india uh, is a source of food security employment revenue as well as livelihood for a large number of uh, population but here also there are specific issues to the marine fisheries the issues are uh, the catches are nearing the potential yield that in the coastal areas that means that we may not be able to increase the catch from the coastal areas in the coming years and about one third of the stocks fish stocks are declining uh, uh, they are being overfished and then the catch per unit effort catch per one hour of fishing is declining in a few fisheries throughout the coastline and then the mean mean size of fish caught is declining and all these things put together what happens is that the ecosystem structure and function are getting altered now uh, this is not only with particular reference to climate change but these issues are caused by all those four categories of issues which i have shown in the earlier slide next one please sir another five minutes uh, okay so coming to the changes to the fish biomass with particular reference to climate change i have tried to put everything together in a single slide so we find that the there is a, there is a, the relative fish bi biomass is de is decreasing uh, in the coastal uh, waters particularly so uh, the, i have given uh, how it is affecting the fish biomass with particular reference to climate change so the the first set of three gray boxes like habitat suitability uh, distribution and movement and dispersal of the larvae these are happening at a population level for example because the fishes are not able to find suitable place the, ch the environmental changes are happening because of climate change the distribution pattern is getting changed they are moving towards the higher latitudes or where there is a lower temperature and because and also because of the like the, as i said because of the changes in the oceanic current there is changes in the movement and dispersal of larvae and the like so this impacts the fish at a population level the first set of three boxes and then the next set of three uh, green boxes which are given it changes the population carrying capacity climate change it changes the population carrying capacity and then the primary productivity there is change in the at the level of primary productivity in the ocean and also this affects the trophic interaction between the uh, between the uh, populations so this is happening at the ecosystem level so at population level and then at ecosystem level and also the two boxes which i have given here that are happening at the individual fish level one is that there is lot of changes in the physiological performances like food utilization parameters are changing like the metabolic rate food consumption rate and then the growth rate these are changing at the individual level and also there is a change in the reproduction like the spawning seasons are changing the spawning strengths are changing so this we are finding at the individual level and then there is a individual mortality also that is happening due to many uh, reasons also this is happening so overall all these factors i have given about eight uh, i think four so about Uh, eight boxes here all of them are affecting the relative fish biomass next slide please this slide shows uh, a sort of a scenario this has been done by the world fish center uh, i'm sorry not uh, the the, the sea around us project uh, in canada 
and they have taken several parameters by using dynamic bioclimate kernel of model. A, a, a scenario has been developed on the project changes in marine catch potential with relation to the year 2000. So for different scenarios, what is given is that for a global marine fish uh, catch potential, uh, the, the, the catch potential will come down by from uh, by 2.8 to 12.1 percent by the middle of this century and by the end of the century it will be 9.3 percent to 25.2 percent uh, at the end of this century so similarly for india it is going to be a reduction in the fish catch potential of 10.3 uh, percent to 17.2 uh, percent by the middle of this century and 7.3 percent to 43 percent by the end of this century and for Andaman Islands, for the first, uh, uh, until 2050, we do not find much of change. There is going to be a slight increase uh, in the catch. But later, by the end of this century, there is going to be a reduction of up to 50% of the catch potential by the end of this century. This has been a, a projection that has been made. And uh, India is also now uh, trying to make a yeah, sort of a projection from the data available from India for projecting for the marine uh, fisheries uh, catch potential. Next one, please. So now, after knowing this, what to do, how to adapt and mitigate this. But there is, unfortunately, there's no distinct mechanism to reduce the impact of climate change alone on fish stocks. So the key option that is left to us is to reduce the impact of other stressors like the unsustainable fishing, pollution, habitat degradation, and relieve the fish stocks from climate change. I think that is the key option that is available with us. So what is required is a synergistic action plan to address all these stresses together. I think that is what it is required if at all we want, if, if, when we want to attend uh, the adaptation and also manage the fisheries in a proper way. Next one, please. So reducing the impact uh, I, I would say that uh, the overall impact of uh, all the stressors put together, I would say that there are a few options available. One is the expanding no take zones, like uh, having more number of sanctuaries, more number of marine protected areas, pro by, and also providing shelter to fish and also to restore the critical habitats, and then regulating access to fishing grounds. Now the fishery in India also is gradually changing from open access to controlled access. So there is a change in the fisheries management towards controlled access. I think this is going to be very important to manage the fisheries in the future and also to sustain the fishery. So that will to a very large extent reduce the fishing pressure in the coastal areas for the coastal fish stock. And then adopting ecosystem approach to Fisheries management is, uh, is going to be a major uh, thing. It's uh, going to be a very useful uh, measure uh, to have ecosystem approach to fisheries management because EAFM can address multiple objectives. It can address uh, the issues related to uh, plastics and also to climate change and also unsustainable fishing. So it will have the, it has the capacity to reduce the impact of uh, external stressors on uh, are the uh, natural stresses. Next one, please. So regarding the fishing communities, uh, the area was mainly on the fish resources. Regarding reducing the impact of climate change on the fishing communities, I think one thing is uh, that uh, the impact itself is that uh, there's going to be reduction and changes in fish catch, and then there's loss of, going to be loss of fishing days, like because of the weather warning, uh, the number of fishing days on an average has reduced from about 200 days, 210 days in a year to about 180 days right now. And then there is also loss and damage to boats and gear because of cyclones, and then damage to coastal infrastructures like the harbors and several other infrastructure facilities. There are also fatalities and sea safety uh, issues, and that causes a lot of life problems for the fishing communities. And then there is the effect on the fishing cost. The revenue earned is coming down. And also there is effect on the trade and economic performance. And from the government side, government is spending more and more to a payment of compensation. 
to be paid to the stakeholders, particularly to the fishing communities. Next one, please. Yeah, so, yeah, I just I have a couple of slides. And then reducing the impacts on climate change on fishing communities is that we have to promote the disaster risk management, improving the safety at sea and safety at shore, and then improving the early warning system, building capacity to the stakeholders and also to the managers, raising awareness, and then financing adaptation and mitigation measures. This could, this could be the major measures that could be taken to reduce the impact of climate change on fishing communities, also less on the coastal communities. Next one, please. Yeah, and then so these are some of the other issues. I think this is the same I have put in before. Next one, please. Yeah, so the key messages from my presentation is that by adopting and implementing proper ecosystem and fisheries management measures, it is possible not only to reduce economic loss and add to blue growth, but also to ensure sustainability of coastal and marine ecosystems and fisheries. This is the key message I would like to give at the end of my presentation. Next one, please. Thank you very much. Yeah. But I think you are new pet. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vivekananda, for enlightening the uh, talk. You have brought out the value of the coastal ecosystem, which is uh, eye opener to many of us, including me which is about $25 billion per year. You have brought out the issues that are impact on the blue growth, like uh, unsustainable fishing, habitat degradation, pollution, and climate change. And also you have gone in detail on the climate change pathways. And also you have brought us, told us about the importance of the marine fisheries to the sector. And also you have gone into detail into changes in relative fish biomass as, a, as, as impacted by the climate change. And also the gave us very important, I think this is very much necessary for our uh, planet, the projected changes in marine catch as, a, as a, uh, due to the climate change, which is mind boggling. We said is about 7.3 to 43.6% by the end of the century. That means it will impact a huge number of pop coastal population. So yeah. And also you have given some uh, advice on how to go uh, to reduce the impact of the climate change. Thank you very much for uh, your advice. I think this is very much uh, useful for all of, uh, all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Arun Padiyar. He will be presenting scaling locally relevant fisheries and aquaculture technologies through part partnerships and convergence for wider impacts in Odisha. Dr. Padiyar is a fisheries and aquaculture expert with 23 years of experience in policy framing support to governments, government program implementation, post-disaster and post-conflict rehabilitation of fisheries sector, setting up and operating fish and shrimp hatcheries, farms, supply chain management, marketing, private sector engagement, building farmer organization, self-help groups, etc. He has worked as a staff and expert consultant with various organizations, including NACA, APO, IFC, WWF, etc., in India and abroad, including China, Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar, Palestine, Solomon Islands, etc. He has established a marine pin, pinfish hatchery and farm as a startup entrepreneur in India. Since 200, 2016, he is working with World Fish and is currently its India country lead. Uh, Dr. Padiyar, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Respected uh, Mustafa, distinguished uh, uh, you know, panel members, and also MSSRF uh, organizers. Thank you so much for having me here and giving us uh, the opportunity to share with you our experience from Odisha. Just a moment. Let me share my presentation. Can you see, sir? Yes, yes. It's visible. Sir, you can Thank take you. 12 minutes, sir. Yes. Uh, let me keep it for 12 minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, so now I'm going to speak about uh, our partnerships in Odisha for uh, scaling nutrition sensitive and general equitable fisheries and aquaculture technologies over the last six years. 
So basically, uh, in 2016, government of Odisha has invited uh, World Fish to be a partner in uh, implementation of their fisheries state fisheries policy 2015. And in response to that, we have accepted this uh, uh, invitation and uh, we started our work, which was funded by government of Odisha. And uh, it was basically to increase incomes, jobs, youth and women empowerment, nutritional gains, and promotion of uh, private sector investments in uh, aquaculture sector, especially in uh, uh, inland uh, aquaculture sector. And uh, during the course of our action, we have supported the Department of Fisheries and other departments in framing various policies, schemes, and their implementation through capacity building and whatever is necessary asked by the government. And during the process, we have facilitated several important convergence programs for scaling the locally relevant technology. Some of the major input, uh, outputs from this program, Fisheries Master, Odisha Fisheries Master Plan, 10 years progressive master plan, which we prepared uh, in 2022, and then also Odisha Fish Seed Master Plan 2020, and also Odisha Fish Value Chain Study. These are some of the uh, major documents which we have uh, prepared for government of Odisha to take decisions at highest level policy making. And we have leveraged the funds from uh, various international donors such as uh, USAID, GIZ, and also local uh, national partners like ICR institutions and MSSRF. So with these uh, uh, partnerships, we have gone ahead with a lot of uh, developments in uh, Odisha for increasing the availability, accessibility, and affordability of uh, fisheries, fish, to especially to uh, people of vulnerable uh, communities. So in con convergence, we can see here the convergence departments. We work with seven departments in the uh, in, in the Odisha government. Uh, to start with, Fisheries and Animal Resources Development Department, then Women and Child Development Department, Mission Shakti, Panchayati Raj and Drinking Water, Agriculture and Farmers Empowerment, Water Resources, MSME Departments. And also we have uh, uh, tied up with uh, several uh, institutes and NGOs. Uh, ICR, CIF, CIF free, and also, uh, uh, you know, CGR, another research organization, International Potato Research Institute, and uh, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, Mamta NGO, Kalinga Institute of uh, Social Sciences, KISS, uh, Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, then we have worked with private sector, Falcon Marine Exports and Uchi Food Lines, uh, especially to uh, promote uh, small fishes in Odisha. Uh, here we can see how this all this uh, happened, uh, you know, in, in, in the government system, how we work. Actually, World Fish had only 20 uh, staff, core staff, sitting inside the department. And we worked with 700 other technical uh, officers of the department through the Directorate of Fisheries all across uh, all the 314 blocks of the state we worked. And they have implemented our source only soft knowledge partnership only soft component of the program we have supported them and it is all in the inland sector we have supported them so we have embedded uh, with the department for seamless integration of the project and alignment of the our project with, for the government uh, and its vision so that is very important what what i see some of the examples here our major schemes flagship schemes of the department here, uh, fish farming in Gampanchai tanks by women self-help groups. So far, 8,000 8, uh, and odd the women SAGs uh, participated in this. Uh, and uh, we have promoted carp mola polyculture, big uh, carps for uh, sales and income generation, and small mola, SIS, small indigenous species for household consumption among these uh, uh, you know, villages, village communities. Uh, and we can see here, this is a convergence uh, program between the Department of Fisheries, Mission Shakti, Panchayati Raj, and water, Drinking Water Departments. So initially started with the policy change to uh, give, I mean, um, to lease out uh, the GP tanks, Gram Panchayat tanks to women self-help groups on long-term basis. So that was the starting point. So much of enthusiasm. Here we can see a photograph uh, from uh, uh, Koraput region in uh, uh, you know tribal area of uh, uh, 
Odisha. The next may, uh, flagship scheme, fish farming in, uh, uh, you know, agriculture farm ponds. This is called Farm Pond Plus. So here also, every year, government has decided, and it, it's uh, already implementing since last one year, every year 10,000 agriculture farm ponds for uh, fish farming activity. These are all very small ponds. 10 by 10 or 15 by 15 or 20 by 20 meters, multi-purpose tanks, basically for irrigating the, well, I mean, rainwater uh, storage and also irrigating their agriculture farms. So to stock, uh, uh, you know, we, we were facing a lot of problem uh, in uh, sourcing the mola seeds, the small indigenous species. So we have started uh, a program recently for uh, mola hatchery development and uh, massive seed product, I mean, uh, seed production. So far, uh, in last just in uh, two months, we have produced uh, four million spawn in five batches, and uh, this is a very important uh, breakthrough uh, with the German uh, GIZ funding support. So this will pave the way forward to uh, you know expand the program and scale it up across all the states in India in the days to come. And next one is promotion of hygienically dried uh, uh, solar dried fish. Uh, by women SAGs. Again, I'm saying that this is all women SAG. Government wants to give more importance to women empowerment. So they are coming up with these ideas and they are just supporting them. What, is, what can be done uh, where the women are uh, traditionally involved uh, in this uh, uh, fishery sector, basically in the post harvest uh, and uh, marketing aspects, they are uh, uh, women are very much uh, involved across India and especially in Odisha also. Here we have, this is a convergence program with Mission Shakti, MSME department and ICAR SIP coaching. So under this uh, program, uh, we have already uh, set up 10 solar dryers, uh, which, is develop, which, was, uh, which is developed by ICAR CIFT and funded by USA, uh, New Delhi. So we have got the additional funds. And uh, looking at this example, government of India and government of Odisha under PMFME program, one district, one product program, already it has decided to promote 50 solar dryers every year for women SAG. So we are ultimately planning to sell this in the open market as well as uh, to ICDS Anganwadi nourishment program. Fish-based nutrition uh, was incorporated in five-year five state nutrition uh, strategy called SOPAN of the government of Odisha, which was uh, um, you know, inaugurated by Honorable Chief Minister of Odisha in 2020. So due to that, we, we could pilot the fish-based nutrition in Anganwadi centers and 50 Anganwadi centers in tribal Kapsipada block of Mayurbhan district uh, from where our present uh, uh, Honorable, uh, uh, you know, President of India, uh, Srimati Draupadi Murumu is coming from. In that district, we have done it uh, one year back and excellent uh, response from children, women, I mean, uh, pregnant and lactating women, and also ad adolescent girls. And uh, this went for six months with support from USA. Now government is planning to take it up on its own uh, in the days to come with the state, uh, state funding support. So here we can see CAFT has supplied uh, the small dried fish, anchovies, uh, from Cochin. And also we can see the fish powder, which, which was being supplied by the CAFT. Uh, this fish powder was blended in hot cooked meals for children. And this dried fish packet we have distributed to women. And uh, I mean, basically uh, pregnant and lactating women, all the beneficiaries under the ICDS program, uh, we have distributed it to uh, take home rations. Yeah, this is the last but one slide. So here under uh, our theory of change, you can see how we can, uh, uh, you know, really achieve the scaling. One is that first we have leveraged the external funding for uh, controlled uh, piloting and demonstration of the program. Then the, in the sphere of influence, that is uh, with the government program, we have taken it for certain level. It's called, you know, uh, for the scaling. And then finally, we are looking for wider scaling across India to sphere of interest, that is all the ministry, line ministries uh, with, with government of India and other states. So lessons learned. Uh, so for us, uh, what, what I see is that bridging the science innovation and the government development programs is very important for sustaining the programs 
and the uh, overall uh, uh, intent of the program much much longer period uh, then interdepartmental convergence can give a lot of impetus uh, push for quick scaling of the program and if we were to work only with fishery department this kind of uh, huge scaling would not have happened and then physical embedding and integration of world fish uh, technical staff inside the department we were one among them we were like uh, uh, you know a, a spoon of uh, sugar in a cup of uh, milk so you know we we sweetened their milk their whole program and nothing else they they had everything every capacity we acted like a coach they were the players so this is how we uh, strengthened our cooperation and uh, relationship with the department and made all these successes to last uh, nearly six years. And then external funding we have leveraged um, uh, for, for piloting because every time government want to see where is the successful precedence. So without successful precedence, they don't want to take, take it up. They want to see the popularity of the program. They want to see the scalability. So without these you know a solid uh, example to the government we couldn't take it forward so we used all these uh, externally aided funds uh, programs for piloting and demonstrating initially and also we partnered with national research organizations like icr institutes ngos and the ce centers so that we can quickly use whatever uh, you know is there on their shelf to use it for uh, further scaling Otherwise, to start from zero, it is very difficult. So wherever uh, appropriate products or systems are there, technology is there, we just taken it out of their shelf and we made them as partners in the program and we, uh, you know, it was like a fast forward and we could achieve a lot of changes, development uh, goals in Odisha <coughs> within this short period. So thank you so much for this opportunity once again. Over to you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Arun. You have given an excellent uh, presentation of scaling up a nutritive sensitive aquaculture program that you have taken up in uh, Odisha. And also, you brought up with the partnership between an interna international organization, national research <coughs> institutions, uh, developmental agencies, and self help groups what can be achieved. And also, you have detailed the various programs that have been taken up in Odisha and the results that are being showing up. I hope what has been achieved in Varissa can be copied in other states also. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Bikram Keshari Bariyar Singh, who is making a presentation on Integrated Aquaculture Initiative in the Eastern Ghats of Odisha. Dr. Bikram Keshari Bariyar Singh presently working as technical advisor with GIZ Odisha, uh, Odisha has over 20 years of experience in fish diversity and conservation as well as aquaculture sector. His broad research interest is in wetland and river biodiversity and their conservation and development of sustainable livelihood through integrated aquaculture and agriculture practices. He is also interested in teaching community ecology and biogeography of tropical freshwater fish. He is recipient of Krishak Bandhu Award in 2014. He has inventory of two new indigenous fish species and 25 new uh, records. So, Dr. Bal Balri Singh, you please go ahead. Dr. Bikram, uh, can you uh, complete the presentation by 10 minutes? Yes. Thanks. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you for providing me such opportunity to present my research work in this platform. Uh, before going this uh, uh, story, I just uh, share you something. Uh, I have uh, in several uh, years of experience in uh, aquaculture development and uh, with a different organization and uh, Swaminathan also one of my previous organization during 2018 to 20. So during this period only this uh, case study uh, was um, done at uh, Kurapur district, Kundra block, under RKY funded project. Uh, please share my uh, PPT. I uh, yes. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So uh, this is a case of uh, uh, means uh, of a tribal farm who, who is uh, intent to doing aquaculture practice and. Uh, we are just to provide technical support how he get uh, bulk quantities of production in terms of fish and uh, vegetable uh, for uh, means uh, providing little support from our side financial as well as technical support to the scheme and uh, uh, at the end we found uh, we get good we got good result out of that uh, uh, means intervention and uh, we found a lot of issues and challenges uh, where we overcome by applying this uh, technology in that particular unit. So uh, this technology, what we are applying in uh, in that field, uh, that counter the soil, uh, means what are the soil we are losing every year from uh, the nutritional soil and the groundwater density and the space scarcity and uh, food demand day to day the food demand is high and how we overcome that challenges that also we can we can try to implement this technology also sustainability means without hampering any uh, means uh, environmental uh, resources how we get result that also prove this uh, story so just uh, a data in background i am just going to provide you every year we have uh, means uh, uh, means losing lots of uh, good soil that is around 16.4 ton per hectare per year uh, in a, a report or a study it proves loss of 5.3 uh, billion tons throughout the country uh, everywhere losing this uh, nutritional soil means upper, upper soil uh, that uh, good soil and nearly 29 percent of the erosor, eroded soil is permanently lose to the sea uh, lost in the sea and uh, where 61 percent simply transport to one place to another place and another 10 percent is uh, deposited in the reservoir so this is the real fact uh, because of uh, uh, deforestation a lot of uh, good soil means uh, and that uh, losses every year uh, to the um, sea area and uh, if you are going for groundwater then uh, this is a practical we are facing real fact that uh, 63 percent nearly one third uh, district of our country we are uh, means uh, 25 percent uh, that uh, groundwater uh, is uh, means uh, decrease uh, compared to the normal uh, depth normal level and the average size if you are discussing about the space uh, average size of land holding declined 1.16 hectare during 2010-11 from 2.28 in uh, uh, hectare in 1970-71, uh, and uh, this is the data of uh, 2011, uh, 2011 census. That uh, if this trend continues, then uh, in 2030 we have 0.32 hectare per household uh, land acquired uh, that land only. And the average land holding at Korapur, if you are where you where we are uh, conducting this experiment. Uh, this Korapur, the district 1.6 hectare uh, that household uh, uh, means uh, that uh, land area, uh, average land area is occupying and out of that 4,355 covering 1,690 hectares of water area means land that uh, uh, pond area. And the fish production around 5,239 ton per year where the market demand is approximately 8,000 ton. So density of around 3,000 ton every year. So this is the real fact. And uh, five, countering five, such uh, five, five, issues five, and five, five. yeah, so counter, countering such uh, issues and Dr. challenges. Dr. Uh, yes. uh, spend a little time on background. Give more on what you have done and what is the results on that one because uh, we are short uh, of time. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next. Again, please. Yeah. This is the research objective we conducted to upgrade and implement a certain new technology towards the bulk production. 
to evaluate the economic and livelihood security of small and marginal farmers, to design and develop aqua-based integrated farming with aquaponic system, to upgrade skill of farming community through scientific culture practice, to study the impact of new technology on fish production. Next one, please. This is the case study. Actually, uh, about the client, uh, this is the purush from Bejai Gudia and uh, from Kundra Club. And uh, this is the challenges we have faced uh, because uh, this is a seasonal pond and the water storage is uh, mostly five to six months every year. And the quality of seed, resource availability, duration of water storage, availability of feed, chemicals, knowledge on better management practice. These are the issues over there. And uh, the key initiative, how we start uh, such uh, means how to overcome such uh, issues or challenges. First, we select good quality seed, then better management practice through awareness and training, aquaponic setup, and uh, dike vegetation. So, so, so uh, these are the things we implemented over there, and we get good result over better growth, bulk harvest, scientific innovation, and more profit. Next slide, please. This is the farmer uh, who's the pond area before uh, selecting this pond. This is the pond area is 378 square meter only. And we stock there 400 uh, fish species. Next one, please. Next one, please. Yes. And uh, this is the resource methodology. After selecting the pond, we clear the dike areas and applying uh, control this uh, um, uh, white. Uh, your uh, standing crop, your uh, tuber crop, everything you develop are there, even level and addition of oxygen. This is the main important thing where in rainy season we are always facing this uh, oxygen shortage because of high density of seed stocking and that is the main important uh, parameters provide aquaponic control. Next. This is the process, the symbiotic process of uh, aquaponic setup. Uh, what I'm I mean? saying again, can I request you to go with the outputs of your research because this is general information. So, in view of the shortage of time, I request you to kindly, okay, directly go to the outputs of your research. Okay, sir. Next slide, please. Just a minute, sir. Please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. This is uh, the farmer invested around uh, 20,450 rupees uh, in terms of feed, chemicals, seed, and uh, all kind of uh, investment side. 
and he got around 40,180 rupees. So out of just the gross, uh, gross um, means income uh, for that uh, farmer. And out of that net income is 19,730 rupees. With a small space he's using and uh, vegetable and uh, fish is getting 19,730 rupees. Next slide, please. So is the table where the fish, uh, feed uh, stocks and uh, how we get uh, every month we calculate the length and uh, weight of uh, every fish, cattle or urua and cheta. And at the end he got 215 uh, kg, 2 quintal 15 kg of fish uh, using the water space area of 700, a uh, 378 square meter. Next slide please. So this is the uh, aquaponics, how we benefited means advantage of aquaponics, better management practice, uh, about uh, 4.5.4 uh, 4 uh, ton of uh, fish we get uh, uh, per hectare. This is 8.2 times uh, more than the previous uh, last year. And uh, of course at the end we get higher income in terms of the community production that provides the DNA bank of the state. is increase the potential uh, rate uh, near the end of the century to come that we are running for the higher income and it provides better farming production for the people that is providing the raw material for the farmers to get the higher income for the people next slide please Then business, so who will be talking about how we can implement the agriculture planning that uh, experience is a push for all research and training for the farming profession for all. Dr. Jimmy Ji presently working as push for all research and training in the sense of understanding urban management to be able to implement the opportunity in our field in the rural area and the south is most vulnerable. Dr. Jimmy Ji is the state authority on the rural areas in the rural area and the rule one issues is being put the rule over cloud over the people that is being put over the rural issues. Most of other rural areas is already out of work for a long 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 time and then the rural issues. So it's not a verbal word in the rural issues. It is for both it is for rural and urban that is going on when we get into the research. All actually, I have to highlight a few points. In the last two days, uh, we all heard about uh, the fisheries in general. But uh, this year is the international year of uh, small-scale fisheries and artisanal uh, fisher folks. Uh, so I have to touch upon a few key points, not taking more uh, minutes. Uh, actually, around uh, 492 million people uh, depend on their uh, livelihood. That is small-scale fisheries depend on their livelihood as a marine, uh, lively, uh, depend on their livelihood on marine uh, resources, uh, of which uh, 45 million women are participate in the small-scale fishery sector. 
So one, one, one of the other important aspect is that uh, out of uh, this entire uh, the fisheries sector, out of 100 percentage, 90 percentage of the people, those who are working in the small scale fisheries are in the captured fisheries. So only 10 percentage are in the aquaculture aspect. So that uh, the marine fisheries are more important, more attention uh, we are giving to that. Uh, then the women involvement in the small scale fisheries, uh, uh, like any other civilization in fisher uh, community also, they have uh, some beliefs, customs and uh, 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 <coughs> cultures based on that their roles and responsibilities are assigned so the women role in small scale fisheries they are uh, take part in across all the value chain process starting from pre harvest to the uh, marketing uh, aspects uh, um, but uh, they are they are integral part and as well as uh, uh, but in the majority of the cases uh, their roles are invisible and uh, and women face in inequalities in terms of accessing the resources then employment opportunities and and take part in the decision making process so these are some of the gaps in the uh, value chain and the issues and challenges i am highlighting three parts one is about the capture fisheries what are the uh, the small scale fishermen are facing in the capture fisheries so the last uh, speaker and yesterday also uh, the experts are highlighted about how the pollutions are threatening the uh, marine fisheries and how it affects the people those who are depending on the near shore environment for their livelihood then second uh, important thing is that uh, this overfishing overfishing and poor fishing practices this is also affects the uh, the livelihood and then third the, the coral reefs which provides a home to 25 percentage of the marine animals this is also under threatening so these areas also fishing grounds for the majority of the small scale uh, fishers then the second important aspect is that the fish loss, uh, the fish uh, loss and waste along the, uh, the entire uh, valley chain of the small scale uh, uh, fisheries. Uh, uh, I, as I already told you that uh, the uh, the small scale fishermen, the valley, they are e the, both men and women are involved in uh, uh, the entire process. Here, uh, uh, the gap here is that why the uh, fish loss happen, why the waste come um, into the chain. Uh, the primary production mainly from the the discards and using of uh, illegal fishing practices or uh, the uh, some of the um, uh, the support system in the onboard like absence of uh, chilling or uh, storage boxes so because of that uh, the fish can get spoiled and the post production also lack of appropriate storage facility and lack of ice and delays in sales so these are all some of the factors affect uh, leads to the fish loss and processing again Again, uh, uh, it is uh, the poor infrastructure and also the in the aquaculture side, uh, uh, the uh, adverse weather conditions also affects the uh, fish loss. Then distribution side, uh, excess supply one time, sometimes uh, the lack of uh, buyers. Uh, these are all the another factors affecting uh, them. Then consumption side, most more discards and uh, excess preparation spoilage. So these are all the some of the important uh, challenges uh, and uh, the small scale fishers are facing uh, today. Uh, then this is another dimension actually it's not talk about uh, the fisheries it talk about the fishers and uh, uh, the fish workers uh, uh, actually the, this is the yes, uh, small scale fisheries guidelines um, uh, uh, the this guidelines aimed at uh, uh, actors striving to secure sustainable small scale fisheries to end hunger poverty and uh, 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 strengthen the human rights actually around 4000 uh, fishers and fish workers across uh, two, uh, 120 countries um, they have voiced that uh, uh, how they want to see the small scale fisheries uh, how uh, how they want to sustain the small scale fisheries so their voices are uh, uh, collected and uh, have been summarized and developed the small scale fisheries uh, guidelines and this was negotiated by fao and it also um, endorsed by commission of fisheries in 2014 so it may um, uh, confirming uh, a strong commitment from government side as well as the civil society to bring uh, positive changes in small scale uh, fisheries sector. So keep all these things in mind and uh, the MSSR of, uh, we have started our uh, working uh, uh, towards the small scale fisheries sectors in early 1990s with the mangrove management program. Then uh, after uh, the uh, 2000, uh, we have started some program, the alternative livelihood program in Gulf of Mannar area. Then uh, after tsunami, 2004 tsunami, uh, we set up a fish for all research and training center in Bumbagar region. So this, this center mainly focusing 
focusing on the small scale fisheries and their livelihoods and especially uh, it, it uh, actually it is a uh, we have the wide range of stakeholders so starting from the laborers and uh, the tribe tribal people in the coastal areas and coastal panchayat and everything that major the sustainability indicator for these things are to achieve the economic uh, development and social development of the small scale fishes and also the environmental conservation these uh, three things are the sustainability pillar for our approach uh, uh, so actually on the capture fishery side we did we are doing some uh, interventions uh, uh, to improve the uh, resource enhancement of the particular region so as i told you earlier the near shore area there is no fish catch the, the fishermen uh, they are compelled to move beyond their territorial waters so we have developed the community based marine resource management initiatives one such initiative is the artificial reef uh, program so which um, so involve the community in the entire process uh, uh, since from the planning and selection of the reefs and identification of the sites uh, and monitoring of the entire reef program so uh, this was initiated in uh, 2004 actually after a decade uh, we did the assessment uh, and uh, we uh, happy to uh, inform you that uh, actually 10 times uh, the resources are enhanced in the particular area before and after the 10, 10 times the fish resources are enhanced and the small scale fishermen are using hook and line in that and the, uh, hook and line uh, for uh, fishing in that particular area then another important initiative is that the uh, uh, introduction of the sustainable uh, fishing gears Yesterday in the keynote address, uh, um, the World Fish Director, he highlighted about the low carbon emitting gears. Uh, the one such initiative is that in the introduction of the passive gears like gill nets and uh, uh, square meshes in uh, uh, the trawls, uh, which uh, reduce the juvenile uh, fish catch. At the same time, it also allow the brooders and other species to grow and uh, uh, in the particular area. So we have uh, mobilized the community in that particular area and uh, uh, built them on the process and uh, we did a uh, participative field trials along uh, with them. So now uh, we are in a position to tell you that uh, around 100 fishers in uh, Park Bay area, they have convinced to use this particular uh, passive gas, yes, the square mess in the trawl net garden. And the second uh, one of the uh, initiatives is that this uh, technology intervention, the small scale fisheries, uh, you know, the Fisher Friend Pro mobile application is one of the flagship initiative of MSSRF. Uh, 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 this was uh, uh, concept conceptualized uh, uh, immediately after tsunami. 2007, uh, we in interacted with the small scale fisher community in that area, what you want for this thing, then immediately they have raised that we want the timely information on ocean state condition and weather forecast. So based on the Need with the support of um, Qualcomm and Incois, we have developed a mobile app. But currently, this app is uh, available in all uh, Indian coastal languages. Uh, the, there are eight languages and English. Around uh, 89,000 fishers are downloading this application, and they are getting day-to-day -day, uh, ocean state uh, forecast information and early warning related to disaster alerts, uh, uh, high waves, high winds, uh, flood, and everything. And then, apart from that, they are also getting potential fishing uh, catch areas. The another important important thing I have to highlight here is that, uh, the, uh, as I told you earlier, the small scale fishermen, they don't have uh, enough equipment on their boat to, like GPS, echo sounder kind of thing. So this, this uh, application act as a uh, tool for them to uh, uh, track their fishing location and, uh, uh, and point, uh, mark their uh, traditional fishing ground, uh, etc. Then this is uh, the actually newly uh, uh, interventions related to the fisher friend only. Uh, we all, actually we all know in India this uh, the Gahir Mada Beach is uh, famous for uh, turtle congregation and nesting ground and uh, other than Gahir Mada the other three uh, the river mouths in what is uh, the Rushikulya, um, uh, Devi and Tarmara river mouse. So these are the three uh, river mouse and Gagir Mada areas are the, um, the government of Odisha, they have notified us a uh, no fishing zone area for, uh, uh, for seven months in a uh, year. So uh, one side conservation, yes, it is important for uh, this thing. Another side, it is a livelihood of the thousands of fisher folks, those who are depending upon the, the near shore area for their fishing. So we want to balance both the conservation as well as the livelihood aspects. Uh, so we have developed an offline uh, alert mechanism in the Fisher Friend mobile application jointly with the government of Odisha. And it was launched last uh, October. Uh, then, uh, you know, this last six month period itself, uh, more than 3,000 uh, 300 times the app was uh, triggered. Uh, it means uh, the people 3,000 
times uh, the people are using that particular uh, features. Uh, so it is one of the uh, uh, initiatives. And uh, the coming to the uh, house, the post harvesting thing, then food security and other things, uh, based on our experience in the ground levels, uh, we have identified three pathways to achieve this uh, uh, food and nutrition security uh, 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 to address the um, um, poverty and hunger. And one is the consumption pathway. So uh, that, that means to improve the nutritional intake of the small scale families. Then second, in income pathway for, improve, uh, in, for that purpose, increase their purchasing power of uh, uh, power of fishing families through um, uh, income generation activities or fishing, etc. Then third, the empowering them on the process. This is the three aspects for which we are working with the women on uh, different aspects. One is the value-added product, uh, the diversity. We, we bring the diversity in the consumption of the food products at the household level. So it, we promote the, uh, promote and develop um, culturally acceptable and uh, context-specific uh, value-added uh, fish products from low-value fish species like uh, silver bellies and uh, even now anchovies are in a higher value, but the silver bellies and buffer fish, those kind of fish are rich in protein, but uh, low value fishes. So develop different kind of uh, products uh, to address the household uh, nutrition security and also for income generation activity to enhance the income of the uh, women in the, pro the um, post harvest process, we building their capacity on quality control, fish safety uh, uh, measures, and also linking them with the different institutions and promoting the collective organization for Bargain, for improving their bargaining capacity on uh, uh, pricing and other things. Then, <clears throat> then uh, the small scale uh, aquaculture is also another important thing. Uh, and the, in the previous uh, session, uh, the experts have talked about the salinization of the coastal lands. Uh, when, uh, because of this particular issue, the most vulnerable uh, group is that the small scale fishes, those who are depending on the coastal lands for their livelihood. So uh, to address this issue, we have taken up this uh, integrated uh, uh, farming practices um, is uh, one of the uh, uh, adaptive measures uh, in the coastal areas. Um, so in that, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, underutilized uh, coastal uh, land, agriculture lands are converted into this uh, integrated fish farming system. Wherever the wetlands are available, this uh, uh, integrated mangrove fishery farming system can be promoted. Uh, it was promoted uh, and introduced saline and uh, flood tolerant uh, rice varieties, fish culture and also currently two blocks in Nagapatna and Mailadugari districts, around 250 farmers are adopted this uh, technology and they are getting round the year income out of this initiatives. And my conclusion is that actually uh, three points uh, based on our experience at the ground level. So three points I want to uh, uh, highlight here is that the concurrent attention to livelihood concern of people and concerns relating to conservation management will lead to the development of ownership and long-term sustainability of any interventions. Then the inclusive planning for all the section of the community. Sometimes what we see is that uh, some of the, some section, for example, in the uh, women, uh, uh, most of the women are uh, small scale women. Uh, even though now we are talking about many government schemes are available, where the, the, these government schemes are addressing the small scale fish vending women needs and address, it is again the question mark. So what uh, 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 our, uh, our suggestion, recommendation is that inclusive planning for all the section of the community in decision making process, it's vital for empowerment process. Then women role in small scale fisheries has to be properly recognized and accordingly support system has to be created at the local level. At this note, I end my presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Velviji. You have brought out the importance of artisan and small scale fisheries. You have brought out these issues and challenges in the management of that, and also the excellent work that is being undertaken by your uh, station uh, of MSSR. Thank you very much. And for your information, in fact, I visited your site before it was established, I think way back in 2000 or, or 2003, <laughs> at the suggestion of uh, Dr. M.S. Swaminathan. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ram Subhaminian, do we have uh, time for any questions from the audience? Sir, we can give 10 minutes uh, uh, for the closer. Because it's a very odd time, sorry to <laughs> disturb you. Yeah, right, yes, sir. So, you. can you please go ahead then? You handle that one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the floor is open for questions, please. Yes, sir. It was indeed a very interesting session. 
but you know, I, uh, certain questions came into my mind that what is the kind of relationship that you have with onshore, offshore, small scale fishery, fisher folk, fishing techniques, markets, women, and a very important thing that gets left out is the relationship of these marginalized communities with the agrarian communities because fisher folk, at least in coastal India, need to eat rice. The second set of issues relate to the caste hierarchies. That the fisher folk along the coast are always considered marginalized, lowest in the caste hierarchy. And I'll go back to uh, Dr. Lal, that even in UP, and there's an ongoing struggle of the Nishads to get even SC recognition. They have not yet been given to it. They are always the pariahs of all the several communities. So how do we integrate those things? And maybe Velvuri could also answer, maybe the chairperson could answer this. Thank you. Sir, my concern uh, with regard to the conservation of indigenous species. Uh, there is a Fish Seed Act in uh, Kerala for uh, promoting uh, cultivation as well as uh, conservation of indigenous species. Uh, but uh, the result is uh, very poor. Indigenous species depletion is happening uh, day by day and uh, diversity is uh, very much uh, depleted. Uh, as far My question is that, uh, is there uh, such enactment in other uh, state uh, for the conservation of indigenous species? Uh, is there any quarantine measures happening in the seaport and airport with regard to the uh, uh, introduction of uh, exotic species, uh, even for cultivation? Uh, there is a license mechanism uh, en uh, envisaged in the enactment uh, in Kerala. But uh, there also, uh, when I was the member secretary of Kerala State Biodiversity Board, I tried in this line, but it is not happening. Moreover, uh, th during the 2018 flood, uh, 2.5 lakhs of uh, ornamental fish uh, species uh, escaped from the hatchery uh, from Alape district. So uh, we don't know what will happen in future. Uh, so uh, my concern is with regard to this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, my, my question or comment is really to Dr. Arun uh, Padiyar. I'm Nitya Rao. I found your presentation very interesting in terms of convergence, particularly at the policy level. And I'm just wondering that uh, you have done very well in Odisha with the Odisha state policy and the integration with the ICDS and so on. It would be very useful to know the possibility or the scope for actually scaling this uh, to other states of India, like Tamil Nadu, for instance. Thank you. This is the last question I can take up. Because uh, only 10 minutes we are given. <coughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. May I? Thank you. This is Anantagiri here. Now my question is directed to both Dr. Selvis and Dr. Arun. Now in terms of involving the women and you, Dr. Velvis, you mentioned about these pathways, three pathways, but also the learning pathway. In fact, Dr. Swaminathan, in terms of Pichavaram mangrove reservation, conservation, he gives key emphasis on linking it to learning and education. And this learning has many components. Now, the whole session is focusing on livelihood. But livelihood has to be linked to the meaning of life because just income, as it has happened in SSG, it is not adequate. And the other learning component is that all these learning organizations, that how do they learn about 
the climate change challenges and new creative ways of mobilization, for example, cultural mobilization, songs, literature, poetry, this is the dimension. My second query is to Dr. Baliar Singh is that in this initiative that you spoke about, now what is the gender component? You know, we saw a picture of a male here. Now how women are getting associated in this kind of initiative? Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Can I? Excuse me, can I uh, just uh, mention one thing? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, please be brief. Huh? Hello. Hello. Yes, yes. Please uh, be Achha. brief. Huh? Achha. 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 I have uh, posted one qu small question in the chat box. Dr. K.K. Lal has mentioned about ABS in blue bioeconomy model. What is the full form of uh, ABS? This is excess benefit sharing under Nagoya Protocol 2010 of CBD, Convention of Biological Diversity Act. So India is one of the country which has implemented very nicely ABS. Most of the countries are still struggling uh, how to define the ABS. This excess benefit sharing <laughs> means if, they, because now the, uh, this, uh, any of the biological <coughs> diversity, genetic diversity or genetic resources, they are the uh, sovereign rights under a country or its communities. So if you take out a company or anybody who takes out any benefit out of it, it has to be shared or flowed back to the community. To give you an That's example, right. I'll uh, let you know about uh, the... with the, some price by National Biodiversity Authority with a front payment of nearly $710 per embryo, which was flowed back to the communities for the conservation <coughs> of that bull. So this is a way of uh, access benefit sharing. That's right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you How we did it in the Orissa? First, let us see this. There is a lot of opportunity to take it to other states. Now, Telangana state has come forward. Bihar has come forward. Already, we are doing this in Assam. Similar. How this can happen in fact? First of all, we need to convince the, the decision makers. Who are those decision makers? Because there is in the, in the government system. Whenever we talk about the program implementation and all, it is the head of the departments, say secretary. Then what we did is that not only we went to fisheries secretary, and, but also to uh, you know human and child development secretary and development commissioner at IRRC, and then also to the chief secretary. We took them to other places where there is already living example is there, live example. We took them to Cambodia. So we have shown them. We shown another uh, uh, batch of uh, people to. We have taken them to uh, you know Bangladesh. Seeing is believing. So and also then we have supplied a lot of scientific material for them, abstract form, and we have made it very key points for them, bullet points to understand what is this, how can we do it. Then the next question comes from them, is that can we scale this? See, we require this much of fish from where you are getting say we require 10,000 tons of fish they don't see only from one Anganwadi or 10,000 they want to go to all 60,000 Anganwadi how we can do it do we have the capability do we have the infrastructure in place for food safety uh, you know measures including <coughs> FSSA certification at all we have to give them the the you know the you know clear cut example and uh, you know confidence in them we, we need to build up we fortunately got icr central institute of uh, fishery technology coaching as our partners so that gave another you know uh, elephantine power for us to go yes, go ahead so this whole thing partnerships at all levels 
no you know at district administration we need to go to anganwadi sahayikas to the district asha workers block level you know at various uh, cdpos child development officers everybody we need to uh, build the awareness give them the good support handhold them for at least for first one month and then six months because lot of difficulties were the, were there in the beginning so i think this can be replicated in other places very you know provided we bring in the people we talk to bureaucrats at highest level but also again proactive bureaucracy is extremely important odisha we are blessed with proactive bureaucracy we take very quick decisions and it's one among uh, the other you know leading uh, states which takes quick decisions so i was very happy so this is how we can take perhaps in tamil nadu recently my project uh, i mean senior uh, specialist human uh, nutrition specialist went to uh, tamil nadu there was a program icds program it was not nothing to do with fisheries but they have invited him to give a presentation on what we have done in uh, odisha so that they have acs additional chief secretary uh, women and child development department tamil nadu government has listened to this he has given us a call how we can do it in tamil nadu so we can work with the mssrf and other concerned uh, stakeholders in uh, tamil nadu we can do it that's it thank you okay uh, i think there were two things directed to me one is uh, regarding nishad in up i think this is more a political question only politicians can answer even the court is not able to give them the relief because this is the state policy every state has its own uh, every state has its own policy of listing yeah that is true but uh, this specific example uh, i am answering that, that what you said is right but these are specific examples where at some point of time that one political party nishad got the exclusive rights to have the lead and at some point of time that was <coughs> so uh, that is uh, beyond our control to answer or uh, address uh, next uh, i think uh, we have to prioritize what we need conservation alone or its equilibrium with the trade uh, there is lots of larger question there is a lot of larger question india has a lots of system may not be perfect like it has got an uh, uh, committee which uh, approved introduction of exotic species uh, but uh, the as unlike plants the in the fishery sector it is that trade directly brings the material or gets <coughs> approval in plants what happens it is the nk teacher which brings which evaluates and then distributes for the further identification but in case of aquaculture it is uh, a different system where the trade directly brings but how much is the risk that is the first question second question what can we do uh, if i have your email id i'll send you a link of our recent one publication has come where we address that there should be stringent risk benefit assessment before deciding the species to bring no species is invasive we make it invasive we make it invasive see a species is invasive when we allow it to go beyond its boundaries or beyond its objective it's a ornamental traders which is the this uh, this catfish which is uh, now is available in many of the waters because they didn't want they, that has gone beyond the size and they didn't want it to keep so and neither kill they thrown in the river who is responsible it is society which is responsible for that second thing if you take the gary pinus in peria i am now addressing only kerala if you see the peria we have been ta- in touch with the peria uh, sanctuary and their wildlife people for a long time for uh, how to handle this but if you see when we have discussion what happens the most of the time gary pinus is available in the area where the sewage come because uh, no other species indigenous species can survive who is responsible for bringing sewage into that because that niche is vacant so these species which are hardy they survive as they escape 
Third thing, about after the rain, we made a small assessment about Paku. After 28 days, the catch, it stopped coming in catches. There was a rise after flood. But there was not after 28 days. So that all escape, it is not every SKP establishes. SKP does not establish. Suppose I tell you the example of Jamuna. Had Jamuna been clean, the common calf cannot breed in flowing water. There was no flow, so common calf bred. Who is responsible? We cannot just say the uh, any animal turns ex exotic becomes invasive. Now sometimes there is a we are part of a management policy which is coming from Ministry of Environment. We are putting this concept that there should be more co coordination with DOR, Department of Fisheries, so that both the prioritizations are harmonized. We cannot sacrifice 46,000 crore worth of trade and so many uh, of shrimp just because the people say it is exotic. When in 29 countries where it has been introduced, there is no uh, risk, invasive risk reported till now. Sir, uh, we can break for lunch. Eh? Whatever the uh, questions you have, you yes, can sir, have a discussion. Okay, sir. If you have time, you can visit our farm in Kufos. We are breeding there 14 species of indigenous species. One species shortly we'll bring in aquaculture also. And uh, maybe on after three days mostly, we may be signing an MOU with your uh, uh, department for giving the knowledge partner for these all species for their breeding and the ranching as well as the bringing to farmers. They are indigenous. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, thank you very much. Now uh, the session is uh, completed. I thank uh, chair, uh, chairperson of this session, uh, Dr. Gupta, who has spent a lot of uh, time uh, because now it is almost 3 o'clock, I think, in the early morning. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, since we are just handing over some souvenirs to the uh, speakers, uh, we'll break for lunch now. Uh, and I'm afraid it has to be a very quick lunch because we have to come uh, back for the next uh, next session at 2:30, please.